I just didn't know any other way to do it. But now that we've laid the ground rule about how important it is, the way you think determines the way everything that comes into your life, how it affects you and stuff. And we used a lot of examples on this. We talked about that the Bible has to have, it has to be God-breathed. It is God-breathed, but you have to mix that with faith and believe that God has communicated unto you. If you don't do that, you can make the Word of God of none effect through your traditions and doctrines of men. So we talked about that last night. I was talking about creationism versus evolution because if you believe that the Bible was inaccurate and that was just, you know, written thousands of years ago and it doesn't reflect our modern day wisdom and it'll cause you to uh, disrespect the Bible, not to mix faith with it. You'll lose faith. I believe that God created. In the beginning, God created. So we've already established those things. What I want to talk about today is what does the Bible teach about how God is? You know, if, you don't, if you've never seen a person and if you've never heard them, if they've never talked to you, how would you know what that person is like? You'd have to go by what they've said or written and actions. And you would have to, through that, you would have to come to know what this person is like. Well, you know, we are all about having a relationship with God, and yet none of us have seen God, and none of us have heard God. I mean, there might be somebody that's heard an audible voice. I've never heard an audible voice from God. So here we are trying to relate to God that we've never seen, that we've never heard. How do you do that? Well, again, the Bible was God-breathed. It was God giving a revelation of himself. And, man, there's so many things I'd like to say uh, this is like what Mark was saying. I got 40,000 things I'd like to say in just a limited time to say it. But Jesus was the perfect representation of God and the Bible is the perfect representation of God and of his nature. And if it wasn't for the Bible, we couldn't really know him. This is, this is really big. So what does the Bible have to say about the nature of God? Let me just share a few things. And again, I'm when we put this into some kind of a format like our uh, discipleship evangelism, I'm going to go into a lot more detail. And I have a lot of teaching on these things that you can get more explanation on. But let me just share this with you out of 1 John chapter 4 and verse um, 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now that is so simple. You've got to have somebody to help you to misunderstand that. But we've had a lot of help misunderstanding this. People blame God. There are people that hate God because of the way the church has represented him. And I'm just going to touch on two things. I got just a little over 30 minutes. And I'm only going to touch on two things this morning. But there are just multitudes of things about God. If you get a wrong impression of God, it is going to affect your relationship. You know, I was told that God's the one that killed my dad when I was 12 years old. I remember it was Easter Sunday morning and the pastor came in. At, or excuse me, I guess it wasn't Easter Sunday morning. It was in May, but... Anyway, I was dressed in my Easter Sunday short. My mother made me wear these little shorts and a shirt. It was, it was embarrassing. I hate it. But anyway, that's how I remember it. And I was dressed and ready for church, and the pastor came over. And I knew that, you know, my mother had been gone for like six weeks. Uh, she was staying with my dad in the hospital. And I knew when the pastor came over, it was probably bad news. And he came in, and he says... Uh, God needed your father in heaven more than you needed him. Your father went home to heaven today. And he told me that God killed my father. And, you know, I didn't know very much, but I, I, knew, I knew then that wasn't true. I knew God didn't need my father in heaven more than I needed him. But anyway, I didn't know much. I didn't say anything. But I was raised to believe that everything that happens God is the one who controls it. There's a man, who I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, he is, every one of you know exactly who I'm talking about. He is one of the dominant figures in the United States. He owns multiple television networks that every one of us have watched and it has influenced us. 
And when he was a kid, he and his sister were raised in the Presbyterian church. His sister and him were very close. And his sister, I forgot how it happened, but she died when she was just a little girl. And Presbyterians are really big on the sovereignty of God that everything is controlled. And so they told him that God is the one that killed his sister, that God needed her in heaven. And this man said, if there is a God, I hate him. And he has publicly said he's at the very least an agnostic, but often he'll present himself as an atheist. And he has said, there are quotes by him that he is out to change the Judeo-Christian ethics of America. And he owns, owns multiple networks that all of us have watched. He owns football or, uh, I, well, I'm trying not to be too specific, but he owns all of these sports teams and stuff and all of you have been influenced by him and he is specifically out to destroy Judeo-Christian ethics and he has been doing a very good job of it because Christians told him that God killed your sister. God did not do that. God is not the author of everything. God does not control everything. God is love. And yet religion has come along and said, oh yeah, he loves you so much that he put this cancer on you to teach you something. God's the one that caused your divorce. God's the one that caused your marriage to fail. God is the one who's made you miserable. He's trying to get your attention. That's not true. Those are lies about God. And because of this, it has given a non-biblical worldview, our impression of God. And I tell you, whoever you believe God is, he still is who he is regardless of what you think. But you won't experience him in his goodness if you don't think that he's good. You know, when I was a Baptist and I was told that miracles passed away with the apostles and God didn't do miracles today, when we got into trouble, my dad was in the hospital for, I don't know, six weeks, six months or something. I had to live with other people when I was 11 years old and I was passed around to other people because my mother was with him and stuff. And, and anyway, back during that time, I forgot what I was going to say. I was thinking about me. Oh, miracles passing away. And thank you, Daniel. I really appreciate that. And so I was told that miracles passed away, but you know what? I fasted as an 11 year old and I prayed for my dad every day and I was believing God for a miracle even though we were told they didn't happen but I believed for it because I needed one and I prayed for it and when it didn't happen that was the way that it was explained to me that miracles don't happen today God doesn't heal today and because of it did you know I never experienced miracles I prayed for them when I was in trouble but I never experienced one as long as I believe that wrong impression about God, it affected the way God manifested himself in, it, in our lives. Because just as, as uh, Greg was presenting this morning, it's through faith. You got to believe. And I was hoping, I was praying, I was asking, I was desperate, I was begging, but I was not believing because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I'd been taught God doesn't do that anymore. And as long as I didn't believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was real, I remember when I was about 12 or 13, I remember going to our Baptist pastor and they had brought, we read a scripture in training union. And I started asking questions. None of them could answer it. So they took me to the pastor's study. And I said, what about speaking in tongues? And he says, oh, that's not for us today. And he just put it down. I had questions back then, but because I wasn't taught, did you know what? I didn't receive it. I never spoke in tongues. I didn't see miracles. I didn't see things happen, even though I prayed for all of these things because I was given a wrong impression of God. It has turned many, many people away from God. Somebody this week mentioned Mahatma Gandhi. But did you know I actually meant the, the uh, son, or I think it was actually a grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. I was preaching and I quoted this and he came up and verified it and said it was all true. He was the one that called Mahatma Gandhi uh, Bapu, I think is the name that he had, if you remember all that stuff. But anyway, my Mahatma Gandhi was exiled from India in Africa and during his exile, he got to reading the Bible and he was absolutely convinced that Jesus was the Christ. And he went to a Presbyterian church specifically so that he could make a confession of his faith and become a Christian. 
and because he was a black man and these were Presbyterian missionaries that were white, they wouldn't let him into the church because he was black. And he made the statement right then. He said, I would have been a Christian if I hadn't have meant one. And he led, what is it? 750 million people, I think, in India to independence and became the biggest figure in India. And he, he had passive resistance and he got a lot of good things from Jesus and emulated. He said that that's where he got his model for this passive resistance from but he could have led them into Christianity if it hadn't have been for people who misrepresented God. And I'm telling you that God is who he is regardless of what you think. But you won't experience his goodness if you don't believe it. You won't experience his miracles. You've got to have the right impression of God. And when it says God is love, this doesn't mean he loves you so much he's going to put a cancer on you to bless you. You know, in the 11th chapter of the book of Luke, it even says that if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Is there any of you that if your son asks for a piece of bread, you'll give him a stone? If he asks for an uh, egg, you'll give him a, a serpent? I may have misquoted that. <laughs> Scorpion or something. But anyway, if your child asks you for something, are you going to give him something that's going to hurt him? If you being evil... Know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And yet religion teaches, oh yeah, God loves you so much, He's going to give you cancer. There's not a civilized nation on the face of this earth that if God acted the way religion presents Him, that any civilized nation would, would crucify Him, put Him in jail, do something to Him if they could. Because it's against everything that that godliness stands for. And yet religion makes God the author of all of the problems. Again, I've, I could preach on this for hours. I have preached on it for hours. I've got series on this. I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg. But look at this over in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. And in verse 9. Well, that's a great scripture, but it's not the right one. It must be 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 9, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is just really simple. It is not God's will that any single person perish. That's God's will. But they are. Jesus even said more people would perish than those who would be saved. More would enter in by the broad gate unto destruction than by the narrow gate unto everlasting life. God's will does not automatically come to pass because he gave us a choice. God is not going to force things upon you. And this whole sovereignty of God teaching that says God controls everything, even the bad things. We actually had a guy that had put out a message. I heard this in Milldale, Louisiana, that Satan is God's messenger boy. And that if Satan is doing something to you, it's because he's like a dog on a leash. God, he can only go so far. He has to get God's permission. And so whatever happens, even if it's bad, God had to allow it. He had to okay it. It may not have been his perfect will, but it's his permissive will and that uh, nothing happens without it being God's will. And you know what? I've seen people die from that teaching. I actually brought that teaching back and gave it to a person who prayed and asked God to give them a cancer. And they got a cancer the next morning and died. And I was present with them when they died. Strangled to death on their own blood. And that is not true. That is not God that does it. You open up and say, oh God, give me a cancer. I guarantee you, you'll get your prayer answered, but not by God. You just dropped your defenses. You took your shield of faith down and you opened yourself up to, to demonic stuff. Satan is not the author of the bad things going on. He, he says that it's not his will that a single person perish, but they do because God does not force salvation. I've had people come and say, would you please pray that this person would be healed? I mean, saved. I've been praying for them for 20 years. God hadn't answered my prayers, but I believe God will answer your prayers. Would you pray? I say, no, I won't pray for their salvation. 
And some people, well, why not? Because that, the way that's presented, it's like it's up to God whether they get saved or not. God has already done everything about saving every person that has ever lived or ever will live. He's already died for them. The call is out unto whomsoever will. And God is not the one who just chooses for this person to be saved and this person to be damned. He has given us a choice. And he witnesses to every single person who has ever been alive. If you wanted to come and say, I know that God has already provided salvation. He is touching this person, but this person hasn't received yet. Would you pray with me that their heart would be softened, that laborers would come across their path? If you want me to pray that their heart will be changed to receive salvation, I'll do that. But to sit there and say, God, why haven't you saved them? You're totally missing it. God doesn't just save people. He's provided seed. You are born again. First Peter chapter one, verse 23, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God that lives and abides forever. People cannot be born again without a seed any more than you and I came into existence without a seed. We had to have a seed planted and the seed of God's word has to come into people. There are people that will sit there and they'll pray in their prayer closet and they will fast and they will go to great lengths trying to get people saved, but they wouldn't dare talk to them because they might offend somebody. Like what Mark was saying earlier about you do not have the right to reject the word for somebody else. Oh, my neighbor wouldn't receive it if I said it to him. So you aren't going to plant the seed, but you will pray and pray and pray and pray that they get born again, but you aren't ever going to plant a seed. That's as stupid as praying for your garden to come up and you never plant a seed. You can pray, you can lay on the ground, you can sweat blood, you can do whatever, but it is not going to happen if you don't plant a seed. We are born again through the incorruptible seed of the word of God. So we've got to quit blaming God for everything that happened. God has a perfect plan for every person. Psalms 139 talks about that while you were still in your mother's womb, all of your days were written in his book. He had a perfect plan for your life before you were born. You are not a mistake. You are not a woman in a man's body. God did not make a mistake. Whatever your plumbing is, that's who you are. I don't care how you feel. Amen. That's who you are. Praise God. So God has a plan for you, but you got total freedom whether you're going to follow God's plan or whether you're going to do your own thing. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You can do your own thing. You can go to hell and God will protect your right to go to hell. He won't let anybody force you to get saved. You are a free moral agent. So God has a plan, but it is not automatic. Do not blame God for your sickness, for your disease, for your failure. It just amazes me that people even come up with that. The only, uh, only religious people could fall for something like that. I actually saw a television program where they had a woman who her and her daughter were both abducted by a guy and he took them out and raped them both, made them lay down, shot them both in the back of the head. The daughter died. The mother lived through it, but she was impaired because of it physically. And she was on this television program saying, all things work together for good. We know that God had a purpose. She blamed God for rape and murder. Man. If I was God, I'd just turn that person into a pile of ashes right there for, <laughs> for even saying that about me. That's terrible. If people said that about me, if you blame me for rape and murder and every terrible thing that's happened, nobody would like me. No wonder people don't like God. They think God's the source of all things. I remember a guy coming one time to where I was leading the praise and worship, believe it or not, at a full gospel businessman's thing. I was up with my guitar and he, he got up and he had just come from a uh, funeral and it was two teenagers that had died in a car wreck. They were both drunk and they were speeding in a car going too fast and it was raining and they didn't make a turn turn and they hit a telephone pole and it killed both of them and he got up and talked about 
We know that all things work together for good. We know that God has a purpose in it. And man, I was hopping mad. I was so mad because he was blaming that God killed those two teenagers. They weren't born again. They went to hell. And God did this to get glory out of it. God did not kill them. People will say, well, their number must have been up. Like, you know, everybody's got a number and God reaches into a hat and draws a number. And if he draws your number, you're out of here. Well, it must have been their time. No, it's not your time. The Bible says that God gave you 70 years and if you're strong, you can go 80. That shows that it's not a day circled on a calendar. It's not a specific time. You, if you die below 70 or 80, doesn't mean you're a terrible person, doesn't mean you're bad, but it means that you didn't fulfill what God's real will for you was. He's allotted you 70 years minimum. If you're strong, you can go more. He says, with long life will I satisfy you. If you aren't satisfied at 80, keep going. Everybody thinks 80 is real old until you're 79. If you aren't satisfied at 79, just keep going, amen. But see, we sit there and say, well, their time was up. It was their time. No, it isn't. There's people dying of all kinds of things. There are people that are depressed and discouraged. There are people that are having miscarriages and losing babies. And God did not do that. He said, there won't be a single one barren among you or any that cast their young. And somebody said, so are you condemning me? No, I'm not condemning you, but I'm not condemning God. It's not God that caused it to happen. It wasn't God's will that you lose your child. There's all kinds of things that happen. You know, when I was a kid, they gave uh, this morning sickness pill to women that were pregnant, thylenamide. And they didn't know it, but it caused deformities. And I knew a kid that his arms just barely reached you. He would hold a bat like this. His arms were only that long because of a drug that they gave. It doesn't mean they were sinners. It didn't mean that they were evil. It didn't mean that they did something bad. But man messed with God's system and you put certain drugs in you. It'll cause miscarriages. It'll cause deformities. And those are just things that we know. Who knows all of the things that happen? I don't know why everything happens, but I do know this. It's not God that is causing people to lose their babies. It's not God that's causing marriages to fall apart. It's not God who's giving you cancer and destroying things. God is not the source of your problems. It says over in the book of James chapter one, let me read this to you in James chapter one. It says, um, Verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err my beloved brethren. And then he says something that if you don't agree with this, you're erring. Do not err, my beloved brother, and every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That's just old English for saying no exceptions. It never varies. There are no variations. There are no exceptions, exceptions. There is no shadow of turning. This is the way it is for everybody. Every good gift is from God. If it's good, it's from God. If it's bad, it's from the devil. The devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. The moment you say this, it it is going to put responsibility on us. And this is one of the reasons that religion preaches this sovereignty of God so strong is because you can sit there and be in strife. You can be in anger. You can have unforgiveness. You don't have to seek God. You don't have to pray. You don't have to believe. You don't have to encourage yourself. You don't do anything. Just be a couch potato and do nothing and whatever will be, will be. And oh God, it must have been your will that this marriage fall apart. It must be your will that these things happen. No, it's not. There's a lot that happens that is not God's will. But people want to believe it because it allows you to just go through life and whatever happens, you just roll with the punches and God, this must have been your will. That's not true. I was going to deal with two things, but I'm not even coming close. Let me, let me turn over here to Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8, and let me deal with this verse that, that people know this verse if they don't know any other bi Bible verse. I've heard this at many, many funerals. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And, and this man that I was talking about, these two teenagers, he used this verse. That's what he taught on. We know that God had a purpose. We know that God works all things together for good. Somehow or another, God caused these two teenagers to die and go to hell because that serves his purpose. When the Bible says he's not willing that any, not even these two teenagers who were drunk and speeding, he wasn't willing for them to perish and go to hell. That's not God's will. God did not do this. Well, this says it is, it does not. Look at this. First of all, the first word in here says and. That is a conjunction. For those of you that were, you know, high on something in school and didn't learn this, a conjunction means it links this sentence to the previous sentence. That means that there's a connection. What were the two previous verses about? Look at this in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So this is talking about intercession and not just any intercession. I could preach on this for an hour. But this is talking about Spirit-filled, energized Intercession. Matter of fact, the exact uh, Greek word that is used here, I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but it is four Greek words put together into one. And it literally means that the Holy Spirit takes hold together with us. The Holy Spirit doesn't automatically intercede for you without your participation. And it's not you interceding without the power of the Holy Spirit. But when you start interceding and you get into faith, the Holy Spirit takes hold together with us and makes intercession for us with groanings that can't be uttered. And if you've been operating in that type of intercession, which I have an entire teaching on groaning in the Spirit, very few people understand that. If this is a typical group, I bet you there's not over a dozen people in this room that have ever groaned in the spirit, knowing what it is, doing it on purpose. But it is a strong form of intercession. It's, it's awesome. But anyway, if, when you get into that, then you know. Now that right there, if that was all there was to it, that would solve this problem because very few people do that. And so therefore not everything is going to work together for their good because they aren't operating in that kind of intercession. But then the second thing right here, it says, and we know that all things work together for good. It didn't say that God causes everything. It didn't say everything that happened was God's will. But this is saying that when you are seeking God, when you are operating in a supernatural intercession, letting the Holy Spirit energize you, that man, you can take whatever the devil throws at you and it'll work together for good. For instance, when our son died, and we were driving right by here on Highway 24. At 4 o'clock in the morning, we got a call. My son was dead. And I started feeling the same grief and sorrow, confusion that anybody would feel. But you know what? I started just praising God. I was operating in this intercession. And all of a sudden, the Word of God rose up on the inside of me. Long story short, my son who had been dead for nearly five hours was in a morgue, stripped naked, in a cooler with a toe tag on, had been pronounced dead by the doctors. He sat up and started talking. And man, praise God today, he's alive and well. And so if you're operating in this, if you're flowing with the Lord, anything the devil throws at you, he can work it together for good but only if you don't, if you give God the credit, if you think God's the one that caused your problems, it's not going to work together for good because you won't resist it. James chapter four, verse seven says, submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The word resist means to actively fight against. You can't actively fight against your problems if you believe God is the author of it. If you believe he authored it or allowed it, if you believe God's hand is in it, you won't fight against it. You won't resist it. And it makes you passive and that gives the devil freedom to run over you. 
Man, I, you can ask Jamie. I guarantee you, I started saying, God, you did not kill my son. You did not do this. And I started praising God. If I would have believed that all things are caused by God, then I couldn't have stood and have rebuked death and have done these things because I would have been rebuking God. If you really believe that God causes all of your problems, throw your medicine away. Why would you want to get out of the will of God? If God's the one that made you sick, why don't you just sit there and get the full benefit of it? <laughs> that is so inconsistent. It's hypocritical. If you believe God's the one who made you sick, why go to the doctor and get surgery and get chemotherapy trying to get over it? Why not just die? Let, suffer to the max. Let the pain be all the way up to the top because God's trying to teach you something and you're diminishing his lesson. I know y'all think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. I think you're weird for submitting to this stuff and being double-minded. It didn't say God causes everything. It just says he can work it together for good. If you're operating in this kind of intercession, then the next thing it says, it works together for good for them that love God. If you don't love God, which we could spend a lot of time discussing what loving God is, saying, oh God, I love you, isn't necessarily loving God. As you sit here and rebel at everything he tells you to do and refuse to study his word and you just do your own thing and say, oh yeah, I love God. No, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is talking about somebody who's flowing with God, somebody who's seeking God. It doesn't mean you do things perfectly, but it does mean that you love God and that you want to live for God. It'll work together for good for those kind of people, but people that are God haters, people that are ignoring God and not paying any attention to God, you can't stand on Romans 8, 28 because you don't love God. And then it says, and those who are called according to his purpose. First John chapter three, verse eight says, for this purpose was the son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. If you aren't out to destroy the works of the devil, if you're embracing them because you're saying, oh, this cancer is really from God and I know God, you're working something. I'm gonna be better off. I'm gonna be like Job, which I hadn't got time to explain Job. But see, that's misrepresentation of the true nature of God. And, and God, I'm, I'm embracing this sickness then you aren't operating in the purpose. He was manifested for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. If you aren't resisting the devil, it's not going to work together for good for you. And yet religion has taught us that don't fight against this. This is God. He, you know, it's not just on the mountain. He sends you into the valleys. It's in the valleys where things are greener and that's where everything grows. And you have to go through these valley experiences. Fooey. I'd say something else on that, but that's just stupid. That's just stupid. Amen. I'm thinking all kinds of things I'm not saying, praise God. But Jesus came to, it says that the valleys will be exalted and the mountains and hills will be made low. If you bring the mountains down and the valleys up, you ought to have smooth sailing. You don't have to go through a mountaintop and valley experience. If you believe that, that's the reason you go through mountaintop and valley experiences. It's misrepresenting God. And you can't have a good relationship with the person that you misunderstand. You know, real quickly, I had these horses given to me. This has been, I don't know, 30 years or more ago, a long time ago. And, and they were wild horses. They had never been ridden. They'd never been taken care of. When, when these horses were first born, they put a halter on this little colt and it, uh, it was now over two years old and the halter had grown into its muzzle. It was deforming it because they couldn't even touch these horses. They were in about a 40 acre pasture and they put food out for them. They would come up and eat the food, but they, they would never let anybody touch them. These people were moving. They gave me these two horses and said, you can have them, but you have to catch them. So I hired two cowboys to go catch them. And, and over two weekends, they put both cowboys in the hospital. They were just totally wild. And so anyway, it was just one week away. The people were moving. They had sold their place. And they said, if you don't catch them, we're calling the Humane Society. And they'll just put them down. They'll kill them. And so these were two horses that I wanted. And I wasn't going to let them kill them. So I prayed. And God showed me how to catch these horses. I hadn't got time to tell you. 
but it was something else. And Jamie was there and it scared both. I had no idea how these horses would respond. Anyway, it's a long story, but I, I'm not going to go into all of it, but I put a railroad tie in the middle of a pasture. I put a nylon rope around it, covered it with dirt and stuff like this. And they would put their head down and eat, and eat out of a five gallon bucket. And so over a few days, I got used to them. Uh, I got them used to me standing about 10 feet away from them and they'd stick their head in that bucket of meat. And anyway, I, I just flipped that um, rope over their head and lassoed them. I didn't know how to lasso them, so that's the way I did it. They stuck their head in the bass bucket so that they couldn't see me and I flipped that rope over them. When I did, this horse, its name was El Shaddai, <laughs> which means more than enough. And I tell you what, this horse was more than enough. And so, uh, those of you that are horse lovers, please don't criticize me. I've had people come up and get mad at me. I didn't know what was going to happen. I did this in innocence. It was not on purpose. Please don't rebuke me. I'm not going to listen to it. But anyway, I caught this horse. I was trying to save its life. They were going to kill this horse. So I saved its life. I caught it. But when I caught it, that horse went wild. It took off at a dead run. It got about as far as from here to that wall. And that rope caught and flipped that horse right on its back, all four <laughs> legs up in the air. And I don't know how it kept from breaking that rope, but anyway, the rope held and that horse started running in circles. It was about a 30, 40 foot rope. And it started running in circles and pitching and bucking and it was spitting blood and out of its mouth, I guess, from the way that the rope caught it. And it, everything inside of it came out the other end. And this horse was wild. It scared Jamie and me and I actually had a knife and I was going to go up and cut the rope and let it go because it was scary. But this horse was running so fast around there that I couldn't get in there. And so anyway, I just sat and watched this horse for about 20 or 30 minutes. It went wild. And finally, it was give out. And it just stood and pulled on that rope as hard as it could and it choked it and it passed out. So I went and sat on this horse's head and changed out that um, halter that was on it, put one that fit, and then I put two ropes in between two railroad ties and tied it up. And when that horse stood up, it was broken. It would let me touch it. I could ride it. I could do anything. Now, it was scared spitless. And that horse, it was an Arabian horse, and it would have its head up, and it was a majestic-looking horse. But it'd see my green pickup coming, and I'm, I am not <laughs> exaggerating. This horse would see my pickup from a quarter of a mile away, and it would put its head down, and it would start shaking like this. It would just shake. This horse would tremble. When you rode it, it was just trembling the whole time. It was petrified of me. And I talked to this whore. I told it. I said, look, I saved your life. I said, I, I didn't know what you were going to... I didn't make you do this. It was your reaction to what I did that caused all of the problems. But anyway, this horse, it always had a bad impression of me. And this horse just hated me and was scared of me. But my point in telling all of that is... This horse got a totally wrong impression of who I was. It thought I was just going to hurt it every time I got around. And this horse was scared of me. And I was, I, I didn't hurt that horse. I saved that horse's life. That horse hurt itself by rebelling at my restriction on it. It didn't realize that I was trying to help it. You know, that's a great example of the Old Testament law. We were going to die Sin was killing us. God, it wasn't his first choice to give the law, but he finally gave the law to restrain sin and shut us up until the faith that should afterward come. But people misunderstood the law and took it as, oh, this is the way that God is. God is mean. God is hateful. God is going to kill you for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. Gave a totally wrong impression. And you know what? Religion has given a wrong impression of the true nature of God. And because of it, we just aren't enjoying the benefits of our salvation. We don't know how much God loves us. Anyway, I had a lot more to share. I'll 
continue next time. Amen. But anyway, God loves you and God is a good God and you've got to find out what the Bible says and you've got to have a right impression of who God is in order to have a right relationship with God. You need a biblical viewpoint on who God is. So Father, we just thank you for these truths that we've talked about. I'm praying for any person in here today, Father, who has submitted to these lies of religion that have misrepresented you Father, I pray that this would help them to change that image, to recognize that you are a loving God, that you are love. And that, Father, you aren't the one who brings all these negative things into our lives. Father, I just speak for this truth, and I believe the truth is...